All righty, so I just started recording. Um, again, everybody, welcome to our 18th lecture for OCSP, and let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about a couple different topics. One huge topic is ether synthesis. We'll introduce what an ether is and talk about two different ways to form an ether. And then we also are going to talk about a new type of nucleophile called a hydrocarbon. And we have a couple of different reactions with those, as well as a third new type of carbon called, I'm sorry, not a new type of carbon, a new type of compound for the summer called an epoxide. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So the general format of an ether is just ROR. Um, remember that the two R groups stand for rest of molecule. So, I mean, it could be any sort of alkyl group and you have two different groups on either side of an oxygen. Now, the two R groups, they can be either the same or they can be different. So just keep that in mind. And sometimes you'll see professors draw like um, an apostrophe like next to an R. And this just means that this alkyl group over here is different from whatever this alkyl group is. Alrighty, so we're going to talk about the Williamson ether synthesis first. So we're going to start with an alcohol. And again, here's the OH group. And this R just stands for any alkyl group. And we're going to add in some NaH right here. If you remember, H minus is actually a really good base. And what this is gonna do is go ahead and deprotonate the alcohol. So we're gonna end up with some hydrogen gas as a byproduct. And this is our deprotonated alcohol right here with its negative charge. So this alcohol that's been deprotonated can act like a pretty good nucleophile because of the negative charge. And we're going to add in either a methyl or a primary alkyl halide. Remember that this X stands for iodine, bromine, or chloride. And you might be able to see where this is going. We're going to perform an SN2-like reaction on the alkyl halide using our deprotonated alcohol as a nucleophile. Alrighty. So as you might imagine, the iodine, bromine, or chloride is kicked off of the molecule after the backside attack. And this is your product. As you can see here, this is kind of like the format of this ether up here. We have our oxygen, we have the R group that was connected to the alcohol, and then we have this R that was connected to the carbon. So they're all joined together like so. And again, we've got the, this apostrophe here, which indicates that this R group or this alkyl is not identical to whatever this is. So the Williamson ether synthesis, the same phenomenon can be used to make thioethers as well. And the difference between an ether and a thioether is that instead of an oxygen, we have a sulfur. As you rem might remember, oxygen and sulfur are in the same column of the periodic table and they perform a lot of the same behaviors chemically. So once again, we've got RSH instead of ROH. The sodium um, hydride is going to go ahead and deprotonate the sulfur and RS minus is a pretty decent nucleophile. Again, it's going to perform an SN2 reaction and kick off our halide and we're going to be left with RSR instead of ROR. Now, before we stop for questions, I wanted to go ahead and demonstrate a little bit what the mechanism looks like, since I understand that there might be a little bit of things that people are uncertain about. So this is our first step of the reaction. 
where we're going to deprotonate our alcohol. So I've drawn out an alcohol here, and this is our base. That's going to take a hydrogen, and let's just pretend that there is an invisible bond between this oxygen and this hydrogen, because the electrons from that bond are going to go onto our oxygen. That's why the oxygen in the product has a negative charge and we have some hydrogen gas. So this is just the first step. We've deprotonated our alcohol. Now, if you remember from the overview, the next step is to perform the SN2 reaction and create the ether. So I'm going to draw an arrow where our oxygen acts as a nucleophile and attacks the carbon for our alkyl halide. And then our iodine is kicked off and we are left with our ether. Are there any questions about the Williamson ether synthesis at this point? Alrighty, I'm going to assume that everyone feels comfortable enough to move on. So for our next part of the lecture, we're going to think about some reaction selectivity for ethers, which is important because we're doing an SN2-like reaction for the second step. So I've drawn up here an ether. We've got this huge alkyl group on one side connected to our oxygen, and then we just have a primary carbon on the other side since it has three hydrogens. So if we think about this retrosynthetically, that is, if we think about moving from this product back to our reactants, we have two different possibilities. So we could assume that this is our, um, this is our alcohol, and we could assume that this is our alkyl halide. Or we could assume, on the other hand, that this was our alcohol and this was our alkyl halide. Does everybody see the difference? Here, the um, alkyl halide is tertiary, while as here, the alkyl halide is primary. There are two different ways that we can split this ether into its potential reagents. However, as I've already written on the screen, this one possibility is pretty unfavorable because the alkyl halide is tertiary, as you can see by the three different carbons that are attached to the central carbon. If you remember from our lecture on SN2 reactions, that's really unfavorable for SN2 reactions because there's a lot of steric hindrance. It's gonna be difficult for this deprotonated alcohol to do a backside attack and kick off this iodine. So we will go ahead and draw a red X over this arrow because this reaction series is not really going to occur that often. And on the other hand, this reaction possibility where we have a primary alkyl halide, this is a lot more favorable because the alkyl halide is primary and this is much more favorable for SN2 because of less steric hindrance. So, the main takeaway from this lecture slide should be that when you're looking at um, possibilities for the Williamson ether synthesis, you always want to add a methyl or a primary alkyl halide. So something like this versus something like this. And because again, we're doing that SN2 reaction in the second step, bear in mind that there will be inversion of stereochem around the carbon if chirality is a factor. So just keep in mind. All right, so the reason for this slide is because sometimes I remember from Chem 3570 problems where we would be asked to 
look at a product and come up with the reactants. So hopefully this line of thinking will be pretty helpful and useful as you guys move on. Alrighty, so now that we've talked about one way to make ethers, which is with Williamson synthesis, we're going to talk about a second way to make ethers using alkoxy mercuration reduction. And the name probably looks familiar to you. And the good news is that it kind of is. This reaction follows the same sort of line of thinking as the oxymercuration reduction reaction that you covered earlier in the course. There we go. Alrighty, so just as we started um, with oxymercuration reduction, we are going to begin alkoxy mercuration reduction with an alkene. Right there, this is our alkene. And then we're going to have some mercury acetate. And we're going to add in an alcohol. Alrighty, so in oxymercuration reduction, you'll remember that a water molecule got added to the molecule. However, in alkoxy mercuration reduction, we're going to add this alcohol to the molecule. And after we add our alkene to our mercury acetate to our alcohol, we're going to get this intermediate. There we go, I'm just making sure that I'm drawing the right amount of carbons. We've got our mercury acetate on this carbon. And we've got our alcohol on this carbon. All right. So this is actually our ether. We've made the ether. It might be a little bit hard to recognize, but this is one R group here, and the rest of this alkyl group is the other R group. So we formed the ether. However, we still have this mercury acetate right here. So we are going to go ahead and add some sodium borohydride to perform a reduction reaction and get rid of the mercury acetate. So what this um, sodium borohydride does is it replaces the mercury acetate with a hydrogen. And this is our final product along with some mercury. All right, so we're going to go ahead and look at a general overview of the reaction in a moment. And that's right over here. So we did the specific mechanism already. Now we're going to look at a general overview. Can everybody, it looks like my iPad was having some technical issues, but I think that everything is okay right now. So for our general reaction, we're going to start with our alkene, just as we did before. And then you'll want to remember that we always have our mercury acetate and we always have our alcohol. And the alcohol, the OR that's on the alcohol, that's what's going to get added to your alkene and form the other R group for your ether. So this is our actual ether, as you saw before. Keep in mind that just as the oxymercuration did, I'm sorry, just as the oxymercuration reaction had, the added alcohol and the mercury acetate are anti to each other. So you'll see this one is facing down, this one is pointing upwards. Then, just as I mentioned before in the mechanism, 
you perform a reduction with sodium boron hydride to get rid of the mercury acetate. And that is why we have this hydrogen instead of this mercury acetate. Now, in terms of stereoselectivity, um, whenever there is chirality that is applicable, you're going to end up with a racemic mixture of products. And also bear in mind that this reaction follows the Markovnikov rule, just like the oxymercuration reduction reaction does. And we can see that because the alcohol is added to, well, not the alcohol, the OR group gets added to the carbon that is more substituted, while the hydrogen gets added to the carbon that is less substituted. All right, so are there any questions about alkoxy mercuration reduction? All righty then, we're going to go ahead and do a quick practice problem. Um, I'm hoping that everyone will be willing to participate. We have our alkene, just as we did last time. We have our alcohol right here, and we have our mercury acetate and our sodium boral hydride. This one's added first, this one's added second. So based on the reactions to, um, that we have covered before, what is our product expected to look like? Well, as we mentioned before, um, this is going to be the OR group that gets connected to our alkene and forms the other R in the ether. Let's go ahead and draw out kind of what our product is gonna look like. We have a phenol and we have a carbon. Now, since the carbon on the right-hand side of our molecule is um, the one that has more hydrogens, this carbon is going to have the third hydrogen that gets added to the molecule in place of our mercury acetate. And our other OR is going to be on this carbon over here since we follow the Markovnikov rule. And we're going to have CH2 CH3. So something that I struggled with when I was learning about reactions with ethers was recognizing what exactly the ether looks like. That's why I've kind of drawn the oxygen like this with a bond connecting it up to this R group, which is in black. And then we have the other R group, which is the CH2, CH3 at the bottom that's underlined in the same color. That's this. So this is the type of problem solving that you're going to be expected to do for especially synthesis problems where you aren't always expect to draw out every single aspect of a reaction or mechanism, but you do need to be expected to draw out the product. So this is the product for an alkoxy mercuration reduction formation of an ether. Alrighty. So before we move on, we're going to talk a little bit about reaction reversibility. And when I say reaction reversibility, I mean the ability to go from an ether back to the reactants. So primary ethers are reversible in strong acids with heat. And I'll draw what a primary ether looks like. It's basically an ether, I'm sorry, an oxygen, where both of the R groups are primary carbons. So something that looks like this. So what you do to convert this ether back into its reactants is you can add a strong acid such as HBr, HI, HCl, something like that. 
And similar to our reactions with alcohols that we talked about last week, what will happen is um, you protonate the ether first. And you'll end up with R O R with the O connected to an H and a positive charge. And this reaction occurs just like our protonization of alcohols that we talked about. So we are going to be able to perform an SN2 reaction with the X minus. And when I say X minus, I mean the conjugate base for whatever strong acid you used. So if we were using HBr, we would protonate the ether with the hydrogen and then the bromine could perform an SN2 reaction. There. So this is primary alcohols. They use sort of an SN2 format for reversing the reaction. If we have tertiary alcohol, I'm sorry, tertiary ethers, they're reversible in a strong but kind of dilute acid and lower heat. So a tertiary ether looks kind of like this. As you might imagine from before, it's an ether where at least one of the R groups is tertiary. So something that looks like this. And this is what the reaction for the reversion of a tertiary ether looks like. Here is our tertiary ether. We have some HBr and this stands for dilute right here. And then we have low heat. If you didn't remember, the delta sign stands for heat. And first we are able to protonate our oxygen just as we did for a primary ether. However, we can kick our, um, our protonated oxygen and this R group off of the molecule and follow more of an SN1 reaction style. We have our alcohol over here that's been kicked off the molecule, it's neutral. And we have our tertiary carbocation right over here. And as you might imagine, the Br minus will be all too happy to form an alkyl halide again and attack this carbocation. So that is all that I'm going to talk about. Are there any questions about reaction reversibility before we move on? Alrighty, if not, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and hand things over to Daniel. Okay, can everyone hear me? See my screen. Okay, so for the second half of the lecture today, we're gonna to be talking about Grignard reagents and organolithium reagents. And then near the end, we're gonna talk about epoxides. So first let's just talk about how to identify Grignards and organolithiums. So Grignards are gonna be in this form, R, M, G, X, and X is gonna be some halide that's um, not fluorine. And R in this case uh, is gonna be an alkyl or an aryl group. And that's true for both uh, Grignard reagents, as well as organolithium reagents. Okay, so that's how we identify Grignard and organolithium reagents. And now let's talk about their reactivity. So the important background um, rationale for their reactivity is if we look at this electrostatic potential map of this Grignard reagent, we see that there's a lot of um, electron density on the halogen atom. And there's also a lot of electron density 
on the carbon. And then that leaves a partial positive charge on this magnesium ion, or sorry, magnesium atom. And although we're not going to be drawing any curved arrows for any of these reactions with Grignard or organolithium reagents, we're going to think about them as if they were carbanions. So that's kind of the trick to knowing how they're going to react. And carbanions are strong bases, strongly basic and strongly nucleophilic. So that's going to guide the reactivity of organolithium reagents as well as Grignard reagents. Um, so just to be sure, this is a Grignard reagent because this is in the form RMGX, where X is not fluorine. And if we look at an organolithium reagent, we're going to see the same sort of um, bond dipole where there's a lot of, there's a partial negative charge on the, on the R group and a partial positive charge on the lithium atom. So this is Rick, Victor Grignard, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1912 for discovering the Grignard reagent. So I guess that's just to show you that these are really important. So now let's just go into how we prepare Grignard reagents and organolithium reagents. So our starting material is going to be halides, right? And then we, for a Grignard, we'll use magnesium. And then for an organolithium, we use lithium. And what's important to notice um, is that we're using anhydrous solvents, so we're avoiding water. So in the case of Grignard reagents, we prepare them using ethers. This is THF. THF stands for tetrahydrofuran. It's just a cyclic ether. Um, and then with organolithium reagents, we use hydrocarbon solvents. And Next, we'll talk about um, the reactivity of these reagents, and that'll give us some insight on why it's so important that we prepare them in anhydrous solvents. And again, we're not going to be, um, we're never going to be drawing curved arrow mechanisms. Um, with these reactions or these reagents. So um, I guess we can just keep that in mind. And, but hopefully these reactions, um, you know, they aren't very complicated. So hopefully we won't need to rely on um, curved arrow mechanisms because we can just um, commit these to memory. So now we're going to be looking at reactivity. Um, so if we start with this Grignard reagent and we treat it with water, what happens immediately is protonolysis reaction. So what that is, is that's just an acid-base reaction where this proton is abstracted from water and that gives hydroxide and that gives an alkane in this case. So now if we think about how we would prepare this specific Grignard reagent, we would treat this, this bromide with magnesium in some ether solvent. For example, diethyl ether. Um, and so now if we ask ourselves, what would happen if instead of preparing um, this Grignard reagent 
in this anhydrous ether solvent if there was any water present. Now, if that were the case, then as soon as our Grignard reagent was formed, it would react in this protonolysis reaction and go straight to the alkane. Now, of course, that's the opposite of what we want because we want to isolate this Grignard reagent to be able to do other reactions with it. And so that's why we have to be really careful to never have any water present. So it's gonna be moisture free um, conditions. And now if we look at this exact same reaction, but instead of H2O, what if, what if there was D2O present? So that's just um, deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. Now the same protonolysis reaction occurs, but instead of putting um, an H atom onto the carbon, onto this alkane, we end up with a D atom, right? Um, the isotope of hydrogen. And so that is useful for isotope labeling. And this um, method could be really helpful um, as a tool. Let's say we were trying to create chiral variants of compounds which share near identical reactivity. Um, so for example, if we were using experiments to determine the stereochemistry of a reaction, it could be really helpful to have to place isotope labels um, so that we know what's going on. Now let's just look at these um, examples. So this one is an aryl Grignard, and this is an organolithium reagent. And now what would happen if we treated this Grignard reagent with water? And equivalently, what would happen if we treated the organolithium reagent with water? So how about you try that in your own notebook and, um, and also try doing the reaction in D2O. So I'll just give you a couple minutes to try that on your own. And if you um, forgot how they might react, try to think about um, the fact that they react as if they were carbanions, right? So strongly basic, strongly nucleophilic. So for this first one, what we're going to see is, right, these are all protonolysis reactions, right? And similarly for D2O, okay, and then for the organolithium reagent, Okay, so that's what, um, those are the products that we would see. And now for the second half of this portion, we're gonna be talking about epoxides. So now again, let's first talk about how to identify them. These are cyclic ethers, uh, three member rings. And now thinking about their reactivity, Epoxides are abnormal among ethers because 
Ethers are typically stable to strong bases and nucleophiles. However, epoxides, being three-membered rings, have a lot of ring strain. And so for that reason, they're actually highly reactive. So first we're gonna talk about how they react under base conditions. And this is gonna be really reminiscent of an SN2 type reaction. And, or sorry, this is a, an SN2 reaction. And the reason why we get SN2 here is because we have a strong base and a strong nucleophile. This is alkoxide, um, specifically ethoxide. And so in terms of regiochemistry, we have to ask ourselves, is the nucleophile going to attack the one carbon or the two carbon? And in this case, we see that it attacks the one carbon, the less substituted carbon. And that's because, right, as we, as Sydney mentioned earlier, when we were talking about um, Williamson ether synthesis, SN2, the major concern is steric hindrance. So we're going to attack the less substituted carbon because there's less steric hindrance. And the second step of this reaction, after the um, alkoxide attacks, is is another um, pro, um, protonolysis reaction where this negatively charged oxygen is going to pick up a proton from water. And so what's important to note here is that this epoxide oxygen is our leaving group in this SN2 reaction. And how we talk about, um, how we refer to the regiochemistry of this reaction is that we say this reaction is under steric control. So under basic conditions, the epoxide ring opening occurs under steric control. And now let's talk about how things are different under acidic conditions. So now in this case, we have an SN1 type mechanism. And the reason for that is because we no longer have a strong, strong nucleophile, a strongly basic nucleophile. Sorry, a strongly basic um, re reagent. Our nucleophile is not as good as before, right? Because in this case, it had a negative charge. But now, this is a neutral nucleophile. And so what's important in this instance is that for this reaction to occur, we're going to need an acid catalyst. And what that does it, it is it activates the epoxide oxygen, right? Because the epoxide oxygen is our leaving group. And by activating it, by protonating it, that's gonna make the epoxide oxygen a better leaving group. And again, this is necessary under acidic conditions because our nucleophile isn't very good. Whereas previously, we didn't need to activate this epoxide oxygen and we didn't need to make it a better leaving group because our nucleophile was just so strong. But now in this case, our nucleophile isn't great. So we need to activate our epoxide oxygen. And now at this stage in the activated oxygen, we can draw resonance structures to think about where is this um, positive charge being delocalized.
Okay, so those are our resonance structures. And in this resonance contributor, we have the uh, positive charge on a tertiary carbon. Whereas in this resonance contributor, um, that partial, sorry, that positive charge is being placed on a primary carbon. And so if we remember um, stability of carbocations, um, the tertiary carbocation is gonna be much more stable than the primary carbocation. So for that reason, this structure at the bottom with the primary carbocation is gonna be very minor. And this is gonna be our best um, resonance contributor because it has full octets. So basically the result of that is the positive charge, the partial positive charge is larger on this tertiary carbon as compared to the partial positive charge on this primary carbocation, right? So the implication of that is that this OH bond, sorry, this OC bond is gonna be long and weak. And so we can imagine that once this, once our nucleophile comes in to attack um, this activated epoxide, it's going to preferentially attack the more substituted carbon because there's more partial positive charge there. So in contrast to under basic conditions where we said the reaction was under steric control, under acidic conditions, it's, the reaction is under electronic control. So the nucleophile is going to attack the more substituted carbon. Okay, so let's just quickly recap what we covered in this portion of the lecture. Um, first, we talked about how we identify Grignard and organolithium reagents. And then we talked about how they're going to react as if they were carbanions. And that's due to um, the polarity in each of the compounds. Um, we went over how to prepare them, and we specifically mentioned how we have to make sure to be in moisture-free conditions. Um, with Grignards, we prepare them in ether solvents, whereas organolithiums, we prepare them in hydrocarbon solvents. This was when we discussed the protonolysis reaction and which is the reason why we have to avoid moisture when we prepare these. Um, we did some practice on that. And then we went over to how to identify epoxides. We talked about how they're abnormal among ethers in that they are actually highly reactive. We talked about how ba under basic conditions, the reactions under steric control, that is, the nucleophile attacks the less substituted carbon. And then under acidic conditions, we talked about how, firstly, we need an, uh, an acid catalyst to activate our epoxide and make it a better leaving group. And then we looked at resonance structures to determine that there's going to be more partial positive charge on the more substituted carbon. And as a result, the electron-rich nucleophile attacks that positively charged carbon. And so the reactions under electronic control, which is the opposite of under steric control. So the nucleophile attacks the more substituted carbon. Okay, so that's, I know we covered a lot, but hopefully that was uh, digestible and I'm sure you'll gain a lot more familiarity once you get to do some problems um, and work on the homework. So thanks for your time. And I don't know if, if Sydney has something to add, but um, yeah, I hope 
you have a really good weekend and I'll definitely be able to stick around and clarify any points um, that any points of clarification that you might have. So yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, if anybody doesn't have questions, you're free to go. Have a great rest of your Friday. Thank you.